Hello, my name is Captain Ben Hurst. I'm the counter shooting officer of Derbyshire Army Cadets. And what we're going to be running through today is the marksmanship principles, but with a focus on the L81 Cadet Target Rifle. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to state the four marksmanship principles, demonstrate how to adjust your position so you're naturally pointed at the target, describe the correct use of sight picture and focus, and state the reason for declaring the shot and the correct method of doing so. Okay, what we're gonna look at first is the four marksmanship principles themselves. The position and hold must be firm enough to support the weapon. The weapon must point naturally at the target without undue physical effort. Sight alignment and sight picture must be correct. And finally, the shot must be released and followed through without undue disturbance to the position. And what we're going to do now is we're going to look at each one of those in a lot more detail, really focusing on the aspects of the L81 Cadet Target Rifle. Starting off then by looking at marksmanship principle number one, which again is the position and hold must be firm enough to support the rifle. Prior to adopting the prone position, you need to check all of your personal kit. You need to make sure that the sling is correctly fitted on your arm to make sure it's the right way round, sat above the bicep and tight so as it doesn't slip down. You need to have it facing forwards so that when you are in the prone position, the sling isn't twisted, which will put undue pressure on your upper arm. You need to make sure that your elbow pads are correctly fitted, placed on your arm so there's no excess fabric from the combat jacket above it, so there's no risk of it slipping down, and at the correct tension so it's not too loose as to fall off, but not so tight it will cut off your circulation. You need to have a shooting glove. It needs to be in good condition with the correct padding. It needs to be the correct size for the hand, as if it's too big, it won't do its job properly. If it's too small, again, it will be uncomfortable and will cut off circulation on your hand, causing discomfort and will make you fidget, which is not what we need when shooting. If you're comfortable wearing a cap, then wear a cap. For the ISCRIM conditions into service cadet rifle meeting, it needs to be of a service pattern. Unfortunately, you're not allowed to use tunnel caps. However, if you do go on to compete um, in the cadet imperial or the main imperial itself, then you are allowed to use tunnel caps and they are a great aid. You also need ear defenders. You need to make sure that they're in good condition, free from any tears, and make sure that the sponge is in good condition in the main cup itself. And finally, you need to make sure that you've got any glasses or contacts if you need them, which we will go on to in more detail throughout this presentation. Looking at building a stable firing position then. The legs and the elbows are what form the stable platform. The left arm supports the rifle, and I must stress to you it's the structure and the positioning of the bones within the arm, not the muscle, which again I'll go on to in more detail as we look at building up the position. The right hand places the butt of the rifle in the shoulder, hopefully in the exact same place every time and it's the right hand that operates the trigger. The head needs to be kept upright with the eyes level looking through the sights and the cheek resting lightly on the cheek piece. This can vary from person to person depending on how their face bone structure is but generally again as long as the cheek is resting consistently 
in the same place with the same pressure for every shot that's what we're looking for marksmanship is about consistency and attention to detail moving on then what we're going to look at now is the nine key point checklist and this is the exact same checklist as out of the l98 skill at arms pamphlet leg position butt position left hand grip left elbow position right hand grip right elbow position head position relaxation and breathing now there is some slight differences when building the position that need to be considered for target rifle and because of the requirement to clip in the sling and get into that prone position they're the things you need to think about first and the butt position and leg positions get picked up slightly further along now if you're just looking at this next slide this will cover the correct sequence for setting up your position for the target rifle so when building your position for target rifle the first thing you need to do is get yourself down into the prone position take hold of your sling and clip it into the rifle bearing in mind before getting in the prone position you've made sure that that sling is correctly fixed to the upper arm once you clipped in you then need to think about your left hand position making sure that it's tight against the hand stop placing the left elbow then once the left side of the body is correct you can then look at placing the butt of the rifle into your shoulder and this is where the sling tension needs to be checked you can then look at the leg positions you've then got the right hand and placement against the pistol grip and trigger the right elbow and then you've got your head position with your head position you've got to make sure that it's rested correctly on the cheek piece and that your alignment against the rear sight is correct you can then relax with the use of this image then we're now going to look at the first two elements in a little bit more detail you'll notice first of all the position of the left hand tight up to the hand stop with the web of the hand between the thumb and forefinger tight you need to make sure that the wrist is free from any twist as that will cause a lot of discomfort throughout the shoot and will cause the firer to fidget and that will open up the group you need to also make sure that the sling is free from any twist at this stage because again as the sling makes contact with the wrist as it moves round onto the hand stop if it's twisted it will dig in and cause a lot of discomfort and that's not going to help at all you then got to think about your left elbow position also thinking about the positioning of the elbow pads as previously mentioned that needs to make sure that it's correctly sat in the elbow itself and well placed on the mat to get the best out of the grip to minimize the risk of the elbow slipping you need to make sure that the elbow is sat vertical to the line of the shoulder if it's too far out to the right it will cause the rifle to want to pull down to the low left if it's too far under to the left it will want to pull the rifle down to the low right so you've got to make sure it's vertical and then you're trusting the use of the sling and the bone structure of the arm to create that triangle shape and that will hold the rifle in a good solid position okay what we're going to look at now then is the butt placement what you need to do is using your thumb and index finger you need to grasp the butt of the rifle and place it up into the shoulder feeling for that correct position looking also at the tension of the sling at this point you need to make sure that 
The sling is tight enough so the butt of the rifle doesn't drop back down, so it's not loose, but not so tight that the butt of the rifle has to be forced into your shoulder. You'll get a bit of a feel for that, and the first few times when you do it, throughout the shoots you will get a feel for what the correct tension is. Moving on to look at leg positions. As you gain experience, you will find the most comfortable position for your legs, for your shoots. However, when teaching the beginner, there are two key leg positions that we try to teach. The first one, as you can see on the image, is with the legs apart, but both legs straight. The right leg will run parallel to the line of the barrel, and the left leg will run parallel to the line of the spine. In this case, you can see the toes are facing outwards with the heels both resting on the ground. Again, depending on the individual and the flexibility of that person may dictate how you lay your feet. However, the most important thing to do is make sure that whichever way you have them, you maintain that same position throughout the shoot. Something else you need to bear in mind is the positioning of the mat. Obviously, the line of the barrel versus the line of the body does not run in a straight line, which will require the mat to be laid over on an angle to the left. This can vary to individual firer. So when you first get down in the prone position, it might be a case that you're not on the mat correctly. You need to bear this in mind and make sure that you adjust the mat accordingly for two reasons. One, it's the comfort of laying on the main mat itself as plays dividends in foul weather. And the other point is having that mat angle correctly should also ensure that both elbows will be placed correctly on the grip, which again plays a key part. Looking at leg position two. Again, depending on your physique and comfort, you can draw the knee up slightly higher and bend in the knee on the right leg. And what this will do is it will just release the pressure on the abdomen by just raising that right hip slightly and will reduce the effect of the ports through that main artery that runs through that side of your body. And this, again, depending on the individual, uh, can work better than the previous position shown. Moving on to the right hand side of the body now then. Once the butt of the rifle has been correctly placed into the shoulder, you then need to draw your attention to the placement of your right hand. And what you want to do is have a firm grasp of the pistol grip with the index finger extending out over the trigger guard. With the cadet target rifle, it can sometimes be difficult if you have larger hands with the placement of the thumb due to the bolt movement. And uh, with this particular cadet, uh, he has to move his thumb uh, between shots with the bolt movement as if you open the bolt, it can catch the top of his thumb. Obviously, if you're self coaching, uh, uh, loading the rifle yourself, that won't be an issue. Um, but again, referring to hand placement on that pistol grip, that also needs to be consistent and making sure you're grasping the rifle in the same way at the same pressure for every single shot. And I keep saying this, it's all about consistency. Once you place your hand, then you can think about your right elbow. And I normally find the best place for that elbow is just lower it down into position and where it falls just tuck it in a couple of mil and that'll help lock you into that mat and give you that stable firing position that you're after finally we're looking at cheek placement on the cheek piece in such a position that the head is kept upright and that your right eye is looking through the center of the rear sight are there any questions with regards to marksmanship principle number one, which is the position and hold must be firm enough to support the rifle? 
Hopefully we've covered some of the key fundamentals and points to note when building the position. And now what we're going to do is start to look at the next marksmanship principle. This principle is the weapon must point naturally at the target without undue physical effort. Whilst adopting the position and building that stable platform, it's not too essential where the target is, as long as you're pointing in the general direction. You need to establish a comfortable position as mentioned before. And then at that point, once you've got that stable platform and you're comfortable, then start to have a think about where the rifle is pointing. Have a look through the sights and see where you are. And then if necessary, you need to adjust your position. To do this, to move laterally, you can pivot on your left elbow. And to move vertical with both elbows on the ground, remaining in that same position, move your body either towards or away, which will raise or lower the barrel. And test the position. And if it's not correct, readjust if necessary. Now we're going to go into that in a little more detail now. When adjusting your point of aim onto the target, while looking through the sights, if you're aiming a little low and you need to bring your point of aim up, then you need to bring, bring your body backwards. If you're a little high and you need to bring your point of aim down, then you need to bring your body forwards. If you want to move left, then you need to scooch your body to the right. And to move the point of aim to the right, you need to scooch your body to the left. Now, everything from shoulders forward, once you've established your firing position, should not really be moved. And you should be maintaining the same hand grip on the left hand, the same wrong, the same hand grip on the right hand, the same position with the right elbow. Even between reloading the rifle, you need to be familiar with your muscle memory and make sure that you're adapting that same grasp and same elbow position each time to get the best out of this practice. All the movement is used via the core and via your legs to adjust onto the target. Breathing needs to tie into this practice. Natural pointing needs to tie in with this as as you will see when you breathe in and out, it can affect your elevation and point of aim dramatically. When you've got a full set of lungs, what should happen is the barrel of the rifle should point down. And as you breathe out, the rifle will rise up. In a typical breathing cycle, at rest, the lungs are neither completely filled nor empty. After breathing out, there is a natural pause of around three to six seconds before you need to breathe in again. This is the obvious and natural point when you will release the shot. What we've found is generally when you breathe in, depending on what you're doing, whether you're doing heavy exercise or at rest, the amount of oxygen you take into your body will vary. But the exhale, that natural pause before you breathe in again, remains consistent. And as I've mentioned in previous slides, consistency is key for successful marksmanship. Okay then, looking at the natural breathing cycle from shot to shot. From closing the bolt, you want to look at taking around three breaths while settling down. Take one nice deep breath when you're ready and happy at the point for releasing the shot. This should help oxygenate the body and get plenty of oxygen out to the eyes to keep them fresh and focused. And then at that natural pause of the exhale, rather than breathing back in, just hold it for a little longer. And at this point, at around 18 seconds, this is the point which you should be looking at releasing the shot. So from closing the bolt to releasing the shot, if you've got your natural point correct, go through this pattern and again with consistency and getting a rhythm and routine 
to your firing drills, this will help um, get the most out of your group. It shows there, so I said 18 seconds, so the shot goes at about 20 seconds. In an individual competition, you've got 45 seconds from shot to shot. So this pattern also gives you a little bit of wiggle room if things aren't quite right and you do need to um, check your natural alignment or there's marker problems, etc. What we're going to look at now then is the minor positional adjustment. Once you've settled down in the aim and you think that you've got a good sight picture, you can then do what is called an MPA. Take two deep breaths with your eyes closed and on the exhale, after your second breath, open your eyes and look through the sights. What you will find is as you open the eyes during that exhale, the sight picture should rise up onto the target. So at that natural point, before you need to breathe in again, that resting point that we've talked about, that should give you that exact perfect sight picture that you're looking for. For the MPA to work correctly, you must be completely relaxed from the shoulders forward with an extra attention to detail, making sure that the left arm is relaxed. Trust the sling to do its job along with the bone structure of the arm. If you haven't got the perfect sight picture at this point, then you need to adjust your position till you think it is correct and then run through this process again. Once you've got the perfect sight picture, take one more breath, double check and at this point you can look at the shot release. Are there any questions about natural pointer? Moving on then to marksmanship principle number three. Sight alignment and sight picture must be correct. Efficient aiming depends on three things. The correct use of the eyes, so any corrections needed for defects such as spectacles or contact lenses. Precise alignment of the eye, the rear sight and the foresight. And completion of that sight picture and the coordination of your breathing and the aiming process. As the sight picture is such a crucial part of successful marksmanship, you need to make sure that your eyes are performing the best they can. So if you have any visual defects, you've got to make sure you come prepared on the day. These visual defects can be corrected by your normal prescription glasses, contact lenses or specialist shooting glasses. If you've got a pair of normal prescription glasses, that's great. Make sure you have them with you and make sure you've got a cleaning spray and a cleaning rag to make sure that the lens is as clean as possible to make sure that you've got as crystal clear sight picture as possible. One of the limitations with glasses, depending on your frame type, is when you're down in the prone position, you will not be looking through the center of the lens. With how they sit on your face, versus how you need to look through the sight. You can sometimes find that you need to look through the lens on an angle and that can then distort your vision, which can have impact on your sight picture. Also, depending on the frame type, when you're in the prone position, the top of the frame can sometimes get in the way. So they can have limiting factors. What I've seen some people do in the past is they've put a little blob of blue tack within the center of the glasses which just helps perch them up on the nose a little higher to pick up a better sight picture. For contact lenses it's important to make sure that you've got a set of eye drops to hand especially if you've got a headwind because there's nothing worse than your lenses drying out in the middle of a shoot because it can cause a lot of discomfort and will affect your vision which you don't need when every point counts. For shooting glasses, these can be specially made. And the beauty of these is all the parts on them are fully adjustable. So where I mentioned on the standard prescription glasses, um, rather than using a blob of blue tack to wedge the glasses up, you've got a fully adjustable nose piece that can help do that. And where I mentioned 
about you not being able to look through the centre of the lens and it going on a funny angle, you've got the opportunity to be able to fully adjust that lens. So when you are in your prone position on aim, you can adjust that lens so you're looking straight through the middle of it, square on, and that can cause a massive advantage. You'll note also that there is a blinder for the non-shooting eye, the left eye in this case. This can be a massive aid to shooting, however, we do try to encourage you to manage without, um, as it will help with the um, muscle memory of the eye. Another option, if that is something that you struggle with, is you can and are allowed to fit a blinder to the actual rear sight of the rifle. This can also help overcome the problems if your left eye, your non-shooting eye, uh, is causing you problems. So once you've got the corrective lenses that you require, we can start thinking about now the build-up of that sight picture. And this is something called the four-point relationship. You've got the eye, the rear sight, the foresight, and then the aiming mark or target itself. And all of those need to be correctly aligned to build up that correct sight picture. When you're focusing, ideally both the target and the foresight should be in focus. But for most people, this is impossible. If correction is required, the point of focus should be, in an ideal world, 2.5 metres from the eye. Again, this isn't possible. The rifles aren't that long. But the closest we can get to that is the foresight. Because it's impossible to keep both the target and the foresight in focus, then the focal point that you need is an absolutely crisp in focus foresight with a slightly blurred target. Try to keep both eyes open if you can. If this is having an effect on your sight picture, then you can use a blind if you need to. Moving on then to look at foresight elements. Within the L81 target rifle, you have a selection of elements within the sight box, six to be precise. You've got a 4.0, a 3.8, a 3.6, a 3.4, a 3.2, and a 3.0. Okay, that is if it is correctly set out. However, when you first get issued the rifle, it's well worth double checking that. And what those numbers relate to is the actual diameter of the inner circle on that foresight element. And depending on what distance you're shooting at, the size of the aiming mark and the individual can dictate what is the best foresight element to use. And what they normally say, bigger is better for the foresight. Um, a good starting point for the beginner is a 3.6 element at 300 meters. And then as you get more comfortable with it and get more exposed to firing the target rifle, then you will find as you get more confident, you might want to open that up a bit. I personally use a 4.0 at 300. And then as we go back through the distances, as the aiming mark gets smaller, then I'll shrink down my foresight element accordingly. But what we're trying to do is make sure that no matter what distance we're at, the aiming mark versus the light around the foresight is consistent. And again, on the cadet target rifle, these can be simply changed by unscrewing the clamping screw, as you can see on this image, removing the old element and placing the new one in. You'll notice there is two locating keys. You've got to make sure they are the correct way around and the right way up as well. Otherwise, they will not seat in the rifle correctly.
Moving on then to look at the rear sight. Attached to the rear sight itself is an adjustable aperture that can go from 0.8 all the way round to 2.1, I believe. This is a really, really important thing to set up with aiding your sight alignment and aim. If this is incorrectly set, then this can open your group right up. And this has the opposite effect, where the foresight element wants to be the biggest physically possible, the rear sight needs to be as small as physically possible. And the best way to set up the rear sight is by running through the following process. Open the aperture up fully and look through it at the target. Close the aperture down slowly until the foresight is clearly seen, usually about one mil in good light. Do not close the aperture too much that this can cause a false sight picture due to the diffraction of light. And normally the way how you'll notice this is as you're closing it down, the foresight will go from a nice crisp black to a slightly grey colour. When that happens, you've closed it down too far and you can just open it up again uh, at just a fraction of a turn. And what you're aiming to achieve is the perfect sight picture. And that's with all of the circles lining up perfectly symmetrical to each other every single time. And obviously this sight picture needs to tie in with the natural alignment and the breathing. So on that exhale of the natural pause, the barrel will rise up and sit in this position during that natural pause before you need to breathe in again. Displacement of the foresight in the rear sight can affect the fall of shot just as much as the displacement of the target in the foresight. This is something I've had a problem with personally in the past, where I will make sure that the target is perfectly centralised in the middle of the foresight, but the foresight isn't in the same position versus the rear sight. I've got a couple of visual aids to help you identify the importance of this. And you can see here, although the target is perfectly aligned with the foresight, if the foresight isn't in the centre of the rear sight and is facing high right, for example, it could throw the shots high right. The same with low left, the same with low right. And again, as you can see here, slightly high in the aiming mark will give you a high shot, low in the aiming mark, a low shot, and so on and so forth. Centralise everything, adjust the sights correctly, and you will hit the center of the target. If at any point you lose that perfect sight picture, rest your eyes, close them, take a couple of nice deep breaths and try again. Focus on the foresight. Having a slightly blurred target is the correct process for this. And remember, the first sight picture is always the best. Are there any questions with regards to the sight alignment and aim? Moving on to marksmanship principle number four, the shot must be released and followed through without undue disturbance to the position. For successful release of shot, there are three things to consider. You've got your breathing control. After breathing out, there's that natural pause before you need to breathe in, as previously discussed. This is the point in which the shot should be released. You've got your trigger operation. You need to take up the slack, if it's a two-stage trigger, and gently squeeze the trigger, making sure that you don't snatch it. And we'll go into more detail in that throughout the next few slides. You need to monitor the sight picture throughout and the follow through. Don't resist the recoil. Try not to flinch 
try to make sure everything remains the same throughout and just a couple of seconds after the release of shot. Hold the trigger back and maintain that grip. Looking into the trigger operation then. The trigger operation needs to be consistent. It needs to be a semi-conditioned reflex. That means you've done it so many times, you just know when that trigger will break. Okay, it is just it just comes naturally to you. So you don't need to concentrate on it. So you can be releasing the shot while focusing and really getting your attention on making sure you've got that perfect sight picture throughout. Grip of the right hand should not be affected by the movement of the trigger. And the first pressure, if you've got one, is taken up while you're settling down and then the pressure is gradually increased while maintaining the aim. The release of the shot should almost come as a surprise, but make sure that that sight pitch is perfect when it comes. Okay, moving on to look at finger placement. All the way through training before you get to the L81, the best practice for your finger placement is within the crease of your first knuckle of your index finger. Certainly for the GP rifle, this is required due to the weight of the trigger and the pull that is required. However, for target rifle, as the trigger is much finer, you're able to use the tip of your finger. You have more control of this position and it helps reduce the risk of the finger catching on the trigger when you're pulling back. It will help maintain that perfect straight pull so you're not twisting the trigger sideways as you're squeezing it down. Got to make sure that there is no sideways movement and it comes straight back in line with the rifle. That will reduce the risk of any pulled shots throughout the shoot. Looking onto trigger pressures then, we're going to look at two graphs with this slide. The first one is looking at a two-stage trigger and the second one is looking at a second stage trigger. As you can see here, we've got the two Axis, one showing the timeline and the second showing pressure. And for a two stage trigger, the pressure is applied quite quickly to take up the slack. As you can see, the white dotted line denoting where you hit the second stage. And then what you're doing at that point is just gradually continuing to add pressure throughout the time period until the trigger breaks and then maintain a steady uh, trigger pressure holding that trigger back for the follow through. For a single stage trigger you're simply adding pressure over a time period slightly slower until the trigger breaks again maintaining that pressure for the follow through. In this slide then, we're going to look at a good example of trigger control. You'll notice that this cadet throughout the trigger squeeze maintains her absolute focus and continues to look through the sight throughout with no flinch, including a good follow through. You'll notice that you will not see any movement on her index finger until the recoil of the rifle moves it. Are there any questions on the final marksmanship principle with releasing the shot? Okay, good. 
The final part of the marksmanship principle number four is the declaring of the shot. It's essential to be able to accurately declare each shot because this enables the coach to disregard any shots when trying to center the MPI or the mean point of impact, the center of the group. If you've got a stray one, they can disregard that and be able to make a much better informed decision to get the best out of you. Declaring the shot also helps the firers focus and enforces that concentration if they've got to declare each one to their coach or even their self. It's about the positive mental attitude in making sure that you're taking good shots. And if the shots can be accurately declared, this will help the coach make the necessary adjustments despite these shots being out of the group. A few things to think about then when declaring the shot. Was the sight alignment and aim correct at the moment of shot release? Did the rifle behave consistently during the follow through? Did the sights return to that original point of aim? And if not, why not? Was it a loose hold? Was the sling not tensioned correctly? Was the rifle not pointing naturally at the target? Was the position and hold incorrectly maintained throughout? Or did you not apply a follow through? These are all things you need to bear in mind when declaring that shot. Are there any more questions? OK, I'm hoping that lesson has been of some use to you. Um, help highlight some of the key things to help improve your marksmanship. And if I've done my job correctly in this lesson, you should have been taught to state the four marksmanship principles. Demonstrate how to adjust your position so that you're naturally pointing at the target. Describe how to use sight, picture and focus. And state the reason for declaring the shot and the correct method of doing so. And thank you very much.